I'm a retired member of ILW Local 10, and we're all here today to pay honor to one of the living legends of the ILW, Howard Kaler. take a look in the back of the room, you'll see a picture up there from the 1934 strike. The guy leading the brigade of longshoremen there is Henry Schmidt. That's who this room is named for. Henry Schmidt was one of the real rank-and-file leaders of that big strike in 1934. Henry Schmidt, and when I came down to the waterfront in 1989, there was a man by the name of Jermaine Bulky. I think he was one of the last of the 34 strikers. Now, both of these guys were German-American, like Howard, cut from a very similar cloth. These workers believed that the bosses and workers have nothing in common and that the, there's a, a class struggle going on and that the basic line of defense for workers is the picket line. This room is where the executive board meets every month, and it's also the room where we organize our political events, including when we did the uh, campaign to demand justice for Oscar Grant's family a few years ago. <coughs> The anti-apartheid action in 1984 was organized up in this room here. Uh, when we got locked out in 2002, uh, we met here, but we also met in the port. But this is where, fundamentally, a lot of decisions that affect the Longshore Union are made. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the president of Local 10, Melvin McKay, and Secretary Treasurer Farless Daly, who, who would like to make a presentation to Howard Kaler. How you doing, sir? Farless Daily, Local 10 Secretary Treasurer. Sisters and brothers, two years ago, International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 10, under the leadership of Brother Ed Ferris, made a presentation to Brother Herb Mills, recognizing his dedication to the organized labor movement. Recognition of such achievements is the best traditions of our union. Likewise, Brother Howard Kalor is being honored today by this administration. He will always be remembered for making the motion in 1984 that our local take a stand against apartheid by refusing to work the net Lord Kimberley from South Africa in protest of the apartheid regime. <laughs> Laying the basis for the action, Brother Leo Robinson had educated our members for years on the oppressive conditions imposed on blacks under apartheid. Our 11-day cargo boycott of the ship was recognized by Nelson Mandela as the action which inspired others, including blacks in South Africa, to mobilize against that racist apartheid regime. Brother Kalor, you retired in 1988, well before I became on the waterfront and became a member of the ILWU. But the continuity of the principles you represent has remained alive, just to name a few of your actions that I know. There was a Liverpool dock worker struggle which reignited international labor solidarity. You attended their international labor conference in 1996. And the following year, you walked a community picket line against Neptune Jade in solidarity with the Liverpool dockers, which Longshoremen honored. Next, I'm going to have the President Melvin McKay come up and finish. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. In 1999, Howard helped organize the march of 25,000 led by ILW Local 10 through the streets of San Francisco. 
and the longshoreman continued chant, an injury to one is the injury to all. Free Mamua, Jamal. When the PMA locked us out in 2002, Howard helped us organize picket lines, rally marches to defend our jobs. In 2008, Howard participated in the IOW historic shutdown of the West Coast ports to protect our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And just last year, Howard Keeler joined Local 10s to call Stop Fascists, the rally in San Francisco. The next year, the next day at age 92, Howard marched to protest the fascists in Berkeley, like Henry Schmidt did. This room was named after Henry Schmidt for his leadership. Howard continued to build his highest tradition of the IOW. It was his great pride that he presented, that we present a plaque to Howard. You have it? Order. He's going to read it out. Come on, Pete, read it. I'm going to read you the plaque. ILW Local 10 takes great pride in honoring bro Brother Howard Killor for his lifelong commitment to the workers' movement, upholding the ILW's 10 guiding principles. You've engaged in working class struggles from the farm workers, organizing drives in California to the defense of the trade unions, attacked by the bloody military dictatorship in Chile, to the historic strike against a ship from South Africa pro protesting apartheid against the Palestinians and to the Liverpool Dockers dispute, which relit the police and fascist terror, you stood with us. You've always honored Label's fundamental pr principle, never cross a picket line, International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 10. Go ahead, Pete. Mr. Killor, I'd just like to say to you, because of men like you, my family has everything that it has today. Without you guys laying the foundation for us, we wouldn't be here today, so I thank you with everything I have. Brothers and sisters, we're learning from Howard's actions and men like him. Today, we just had a picket and we did not cross it. For the OCU, okay? One of the things that we have in store with ILWU are more plaques for men and women of the same nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel and Pete. Um, before we get started, I just want to uh, let people know that on the table back here, we have solidarity messages from uh, organizations and trade unions around the world. Uh, they're free for everyone to take the different pamphlets and literature, some of which Howard wrote years ago. Um, and also, we have posters like the multinational uh, corporation trainer, that was for the Neptune Jays struggle, which you'll hear more about later. The Stop the War poster uh, in the 2008 West Coast shutdown of all the ports to oppose the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, that poster was made. Actually, I got to give props to the artist, Doug Minkler, yeah. who is who was given the task by uh, our international president back in the time of the Liverpool Dockers, Brian McWilliams. Brian, stand up, please. Uh, 
Uh, we also have uh, Steve Stallone, who was the editor of the Dispatcher back then. In my opinion, the best editor that the Dispatcher has ever seen. He was out there on the front lines during the Neptune J dispute in which we uh, had a solidarity action for the Liverpool Dockers, and he made it happen. So Steve, stand up, please. Steve Stallone. Uh, and one other individual before I forget is the ILWU's historian, Harvey Schwartz. I don't know where you are, Harvey, but there we are. Okay. Thank you all. So these posters from the Neptune Jade and from the anti-war West Coast shutdown are available for donations for the legal defense of Mumia Abu-Jamal, America's most well-known political prisoner. So please, uh, they're on the table back there, and we have extras up here. Um, and the banners and the picket signs are made available through the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee, of which I chair, and this is our last organized event. Um, the food in the back is uh, provided by Mary Jane Galviso, excellent Filipino cuisine. And, and we have drinks as well at the bar back there, non-alcoholic. Um, so with that, <laughs> uh, the first point on the program, by the way, the program is back there. I don't know it by heart. Nobody does. But it's back there on the table if anybody wants to get a copy. The first uh, point on the program is the video of the anti-apartheid actions in 84 and 86 compiled by Howard's daughter, Isis. But <clears throat> his father, uh, Larry Wright, was in the video on Pier 80 on the anti-apartheid action. And they come from a long line of radicals, communists even. His father, Aaron's grandfather, Larry's father, was a leader of the Mine Mill and Smelters Workers Union. And if anybody saw the salt of the earth, that video that was made during the McCarthy period, Larry was actually one of the kids in that video. So, comrades, brothers and sisters, Larry Wright, one of the organizers of that anti-apartheid action. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here to recognize Brother Howard Keeler. We've, I've known him for, well, so I've been in the union for 49 years. I've, known him and known about him that whole time. We worked together on many things. Today I'm going to talk about the uh, action that we had in 1984 where we stopped the ship. A lot of it, or some of it's been shown and talked about on the video here. When I came in the Union I was working in an organization called Liberation Support Movement that was supporting the African Liberation Movements. And we published a lot of material, life histories of people in the revolution. I put some samples of it on the table back there that you can look at. Please don't take them. I don't have a lot left, but uh, that, that was material that we used when we uh, were, when the committee that, that did this work was, was uh, educating the members of the local, and a lot of the members of our local actually got and read that material. The, in 1976, there were a lot of guys in the union, Leo Robinson and Howard Keeler stand out, uh, that were very aware of the struggles in South Africa. It wasn't just in South Africa, but in Zimbabwe, in the uh, Portuguese colonies where there were struggles uh, against uh, Portuguese colonialism for Limo and Mozambique the popular movement for the liberation of Angola and Angola. Also, there was a, an armed struggle in Namibia, the Southwest African People's Organization. 
So all across Southern Africa, there was, there was armed struggle, there was revolution. Many of the leaders of these uh, different struggles understood that to really achieve freedom, that they would have to also uh, make a break from the capitalist economy and build socialist revolutions. In 1976, a number of us came together after the Soweto uprisings in South Africa, and we decided we wanted to do something more. And we formed a committee in the Union. We called it the Southern African Liberation Support Committee. And we were an official committee of the Union, and we wanted to start educating the membership about the struggles and also uh, to give support. There were some uh, Zimbabwean representatives in, in, uh, of Zanu, and they wanted to have a clothing collection and send clothing to Zimbabwean refugees in Mozambique. So we joined that. Our committee was able to get two 20-foot containers donated by one of the shipping companies. We were also able to get free shipping of these containers over to Mozambique. The local ten hall was used as a place where people could come and drop off clothing. It was one of the places that could happen. And big piles of clothes piled up in the hall, and then people came down, a lot of the other support organizations, people on the left, came down and they sorted the clothes, they laundered some of them, they packed them up, and they were put in these containers, and we were able to ship them to uh, Eastern Africa. And, uh, another thing that we were able to do with our members, we had access to films, and we had some excellent films. There was one about Mozambique, Aluta Continua, you may have seen it. There was an excellent film about apartheid in South Africa, entitled The Last Grave at Tambaza. It was made by a Dutch film crew in the early 70s. It was an hour long, and it really showed the horrors of apartheid. There was a section in the film where uh, it described how the uh, majority black population was pushed out into the bad lands there. They call them the Bantu sands, the homelands. Of the, uh, and and uh, there was a, a South African politician who was saying that the that, that that was their, their land and they weren't allowed in South Africa except to sell their labor. And, uh, and that uh, when black workers came into to South Africa, they weren't able to come with their families. Their families had to, to uh, stay uh, in, the, in the homelands. Uh, the uh, the workers that did come to work uh, had to leave their families there, whether men or women, and uh, the children were taken care of by other people in the family, often raised by the grandparents, and their parents saw them very rarely when they could get back. And uh, so if a man came in to work in the mines or in the factories or on the docks, they had to live in these dormitories and they were separated from their families. And uh, this was a, just a, a terrible, uh, inhumane system. It was really a system of slave labor. And we showed this film to the Longshore Union. There must have been two to three hundred longshoremen there. And it was very somber mood. And uh, after the film, Howard got up. He talked about it uh, in the video. He made a resolution that the next ship that comes in was South African cargo. The local town refused to, to unload it. And at first there was some objection. A few people argued that, well, this is illegal against our contract. We can't do that. We could be fined. We could run, run into trouble. But the general consensus was that, uh, that things were were so bad in South Africa and we had a chance to do something and that this is something we had to do and uh, we deal with the legalities later if we had to. And so the resolution passed. We saw that, went to the local leadership the next day, the members of our committee, 
And uh, they, they told us, well, you know, the membership passes, so you guys can do it, but we're not going to do it. You're going to have to take the lead in it. And that was fine with us because we had been educating and organizing our membership and other people that were supporting the work we were doing. And uh, we were really the ones to take the lead. We got people in the clerks' union who were part of it to look at the ship's manifest and pick out a, a ship that looked like a good target. There was one coming in a few weeks. We had all this support that we had built up over the years uh, from other organizations, community organizations, other political organizations, the gay community, students, and uh, so we we told all, organized all these people that when the ship first works, we want to have a big demonstration down on the on the in the terminal where the where the ship would be. So the day came, longshoremen were dispatched to work the ship, knowing that they weren't going to go to work, it was a union position. There was this big demonstration. The longshoremen showed up and stood by, and uh, the whole thing really attracted the news media. You saw pictures of the ship sitting there. There was a, one TV station that ran a, a store every, every night showing that ship sitting idly and explaining, and we got to do interviews, other people got to make statements. The news media, the, the press also covered it, and it lasted for 11 days. So during this whole time, we had, we had uh, big demonstrations, and we had all this, and uh, the uh, anti-apartheid anti -apartheid movement just really came together and exploded, a whole coalition of all these people. Uh, there was a red ribbon campaign where people wore red ribbons signifying stop apartheid, and uh, when, when the uh, 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 thing finally ended, the injunction came down after 10 days. So on the 11th day, the officers of the union told us that we had to, uh, we had to give up the campaign and, and uh, work the ship. So we got a huge demonstration down there that day. There was some chaos on the, on the, on the dock and uh, Eventually, the police came and cleared a path, and uh, the longshoremen were going to go to work, but one longshoreman got arrested for trying to block a truck. So then the longshoremen refused to go to work until they released them. And they wanted to get the ship worked so badly that they released this guy, and eventually it got worked. But the, the, uh, the action was a tremendous success, and it brought together a, a movement that continued to grow. There were well, there were rallies down at the PMA office every Friday at noon, where people got up and talked about apartheid, talked about the struggles in Southern Africa. The students at the University of California and some of the faculty organized a big uh, disinvestment campaign. I went to a meeting over there, and there were hundreds of people in this big hall talking and putting pressure on the university administration to divest from its investments in South Africa. Just all kinds of things happened after that. And then you saw that uh, Nelson Mandela came here in 1990. One of the big, actually, demands of this big campaign was free Nelson Mandela, free political prisoners. And I think pressure from, from here, but also from around the world, he finally was uh, freed from decades of uh, imprisonment in Robben Island, and uh, in the late 80s, he came here, he spoke, the, the uh, Oakland Coliseum was packed, I don't think everybody could get in, and you know, he, he saw that he, uh, right off the bat, credited the longshoremen and the anti-apartheid movement in the Bay Area for their solidarity and the work they had done. And uh, that's, I'm sure most of you know most of this story, but that, there was a lot of work over the years put in by uh, the Longshore Committee to uh, educate people in our union and other people, and that's what it took to make, make this a historic action. And Howard and was one of the, the leaders of this. His vision, his uh, knowledge, his commitment, and his leadership played a huge role in uh, making this such a success, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to uh, 
be here to talk about it and uh, to thank Howard. I'm not going to start right away. Uh, one other person that uh, needs to be acknowledged isn't here, uh, Gene Weisberger. He played an important part in that anti-apartheid action. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you how it went down. Howard made the motion to hit the next ship that comes in from South Africa. Leo Robinson stood up and amended it and said, we're only going to refuse to work the South African cargo. There was cargo on top of that from Australia. So it took the clerks to figure out when they're finished with this a Fremantle Australia cargo, and that was Gene Weisberger. And when he gave the word that it's South African cargo, everybody hit the bricks. So um, in, interspersed between the speakers, I want to read a couple passages, not the full letters, from different trade unions and organizations around the world for Howard. And this is from Unite. 1.4 million members in Britain. They are now, uh, the Liverpool dock workers are now affiliated to that union. I think it's the largest or second largest in Britain. I've recently been told that your health is not as good as it used to be. This concerned me greatly as your name has legendary status here in Liverpool. Many know of your involvement in the labor movement, particularly your battle against apartheid. Your involvement in the historic West Coast port shutdown in protest against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And also your role in the campaign to free Mumia Abu Jamal. And that's from Bobby Morton one of the officers of UNITE. I just want to say, Howard is confined to a wheelchair, but his mind is not confined. He's as sharp as ever. I want to give you an example. So <clears throat> this is the 10th anniversary of that uh, West Coast shutdown of all the ports to oppose the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so uh, I was invited by the Bay Area Labor History Workshop to give a presentation on that action. And uh, I think Harvey Schwartz is a member of the, that organization, mostly academics, labor officials, and activists. And so I invited Howard and Herb Mills, both of them in their wheelchairs, to come and hear the presentation because, as I explained to the audience, our action to shut down all the ports on the West Coast didn't just fall from the sky. There's a history to it. And I started out by explaining that Herb Mills in 1978 organized longshoremen to refuse to load bombs to the military dictatorship in Chile. And that was followed a few years later by Howard Kaler making a motion amended by Leo Robinson to hit this next ship that came in from South Africa and refuse to work that cargo. So this is the kind of history that Local 10 is proud of and helped lay the basis for our anti-imperialist strike against the war. Um, I came to find out, and I explained this to the audience, that you know I thought that was the first strike against an imperialist war by American workers. But it wasn't. In 1918, longshoremen up in Seattle got wind that there was a ship ready to be loaded with arms for the white counter-revolutionaries who were trying to overthrow the first workers' government, the Soviet government in Russia. And they refused to load arms against, that would be used against their brothers and sisters in the new Soviet Union. And that word went out, up and down the whole West Coast. Nobody is to work this ship to load arms for the counter-revolutionaries. And the same thing was going on in Baltimore, by the way. 
So that was actually the first strike against an imperialist war because the US was supporting counter-revolution. Surprise. Uh, back in 1918. Um, so there was a young sailor by the name of Harry Bridges, who was sort of a wobbly type, IWW. And he said, just a few years before he died, that the most significant event in his life was the Russian Workers' Revolution. It was the first successful Workers' Revolution. And it wasn't just Harry Bridges. There were others like Henry Schmidt, Jermaine Bulky. A lot of the leaders of the Longshore Strike in 34 were sympathetic to a workers' revolution. And it wasn't just in San Francisco that there were major strikes in 1934. And I told this uh, labor history group that there was also a major strike in Minneapolis by the Teamsters. Right. There was another one in Toledo, Ohio by Autolite workers. Those three strikes shook the pillars of American capitalism. They were scared to death that a revolution was coming to America. And um, so when I, I finished my speech, uh, one of the, someone asked me, so what was the common theme between all three of these strikes? And, and I just gave some sort of abstract answer. I didn't really nail it. So I'm driving Howard home afterwards. This is to show you how sharp this guy is. He says, Jack. I said, what, Howard? He said, look, there were three things that were common to all three of those strikes in 1934. Number one, the National Guard and police were mobilized against the strikers. Number two, the police forces killed strikers in each of those strikes. And number three, there were communists in the leadership of each of those strikes. And I said, Howard, you're right, thank you. <laughs> so um, I just thought I'd point that out to sh give you an idea that even though he's here in a wheelchair, he's sharp as ever. Um, So as the plaque was presented to Howard, um, the basic line of defense for workers in this class struggle is the picket line. And Howard has honored that picket line. And that's one of the fundamental principles in our 10 guided principles in the ILWU. By the way, the 10 guiding principles was formulated during the McCarthy period because the leadership of the ILWU was convinced that they were going to jail. The government was going to imprison anybody who was a radical. It's not the first time it's happened in history. And so they formulated the 10 guiding principles. And honoring the pick line is one. And I just got to read you because it, I think it's brilliant. And Chris Howard has always stood by this principle. This is from the 10 Guiding Principles of the ILWU. Labor solidarity means just that. Unions have to accept the fact that the solidarity of labor stands above all else, including even the so-called sanctity of the contract. We cannot adopt for ourselves the policies of union leaders who insist that because they have a contract, their members are compelled to perform work even behind a picket line. Every picket line must be res respected as if it were our own. And that's one of the 10 guiding principles that we should be living by today. And it's the kind of lesson that Howard has imparted to the younger generation. And I hope Clarence and I have able to impart that to the younger brothers and sisters that are coming up in Local 10. I'm going to give you three examples of how Howard has actually implemented the principle of honoring a picket line. Number one, in 1984, when I was new to the Bay Area, I was in the Inland Boatman's Union. We had a short strike. This was right before the anti-apartheid action. And what we did on the barges was fuel up ships, bunker ships. 
And Howard, Howard and I were already friends, comrades. And I, I said, uh, Howard, we're going out on strike. We could use all the support we can get from the Longshore Union. And he says, I'm there for you. I got your back. So Howard uh, called me one day, and he said, hey, there's a barge alongside the ship right down here on the Embarcadero at the passenger terminal, Pier 35. You better get a picket line down here. Get your guys down here fast. And so we sent a picket line down right away. He got a hold of the BA at the time, a guy named Doherty, I think. Was that right, Howard? Doherty? Yeah. And Doherty was down here in a flash because it's you can walk to Pier 35 from here. Howard said, there's a picket line up here. We got to get all the longshoremen off the picket line. Uh, excuse me, off the ship. And so as soon as the BA showed up, all the longshoremen, pour, uh, <laughs> they piled off the ship, out the terminal, and uh, it showed to us strikers. We were, just, we were a small uh, group of tankermen in the Inland Boatmen's Union. We had just come into the ILWU. And, but what it showed us is the power that workers have at the point of production, when their labor was withdrawn. And that strike was over uh, quickly. By the way, Harry Bridges took note of that short-lived but very militant strike. Um, that was 1984. Now, the point of honoring a picket line doesn't mean you, it's not simply you don't cross a picket line, but you don't work behind the picket line. That's what it said in the 10 guiding principles. So in 1987, we had a big strike. Marina Secretano was over here. I just I didn't know you were here before. She's now the president of the Inland Boatman's Union for the whole West Coast. Marina, stand up. So in 1987, we struck against Crowley Maritime. And um, it was the whole West Coast. It wasn't a small strike this time. And we had gotten wind that there was a, bar, a scab barge came in from Hawaii with pineapple on it. And one of the provisions in the longshore contract is we don't strike against military cargo. We don't strike against passenger ships, and we don't strike against perishable goods. We let all that stuff go. Um, that's what the contract says. <laughs> but what happened was, once again, Gene Weisberger from the clerks union discovered that, wait a minute, this was a not fresh, perishable pineapple. This was canned pineapple. <laughs> so we immediately put a picket line up down in Redwood City. Now, Howard was on the lines board then, and he's monitoring with this radio, and he found out in the middle of the night, we had a picket line over in Oakland where Crowley was, had been docked. No longshoremen were working. And Crowley, the union buster that he is, said, I got to get this barge worked. So he sent it down in the middle of the night to Redwood City. But Howard heard it on his radio. So we put our picket lines up down there. Again, Gene Weisberger, Local 34, <laughs> said to the president of Local 34, Frank Bellici, there are scabs working on this barge down in Redwood City. That's our jurisdiction. We need to pull the pin. And soon as law, uh, the clerks, ship clerks, walked off the jobs in the whole port, the longshoremen followed. We had several hundred people down there at Redwood City. Howard was responsible for that because he had the intelligence through the radio, but also the idea of a mass picket line. So here we are amassed at the main terminal gate, several hundred longshoremen and boatmen, and the uh, security guards, noon, lunchtime, they take off. So we got, we got this big cyclone fence here, nobody between us and the scabs on the barge. And we, Eddie Gutierrez, I don't know if he's here, he was BA at the time. We pushed the gates open and we went marching down. Some guys had baseball bats. I think there was a game somewhere around there. And <laughs> somebody else had a sledgehammer. <laughs> and we went steadily marching down to the ship. And those scabs, now they were union scabs from the machinists, operating engineers and laborers. They came jumping off the ship, off the barge. 
down the containers, onto the dock, and they jumped into a, a bus that was waiting for them because they saw we were going to take care of business. <laughs> they jumped into the bus. They couldn't come out the main terminal. They had the uh, gate. They had to go out the back gate. And they floored it and got to the back gate, but it was locked. <laughs> and we just kept steady marching towards them. So finally, the, the driver just hit the accelerator and flew and blew open the uh, cyclone fence gate, and they got out of it. But they never came back. And that, if we had more actions like that, we would have won that goddamn strike. Thank you, Howard, for that. I'm sorry, one, one more incident was a 1997 strike. It wasn't really a strike, it was a picket line. In, in 1996, the Liverpool Dockers got locked out. Howard was at the International Conference with me in 1996, and they put forward one request to the labor movement around the world, do a solidarity action for us. This is an international struggle. We're locked out here, 500 of us. We need your support. And so we were scratching our heads. Well, we don't really get ships from Liverpool out here. So it took the genius of Steve Stallone, the editor of the Dispatcher, which is why I say he was the best that I've worked with. He researched and found out that there was a ship coming here, <clears throat> but it was from Thamesport, England. Now, Thamesport isn't Liverpool. But he said, well, what the hell? It's the same company that administers both of those ports. Let's just call it a scab ship. <laughs> and that was the Neptune Jade. When the Neptune Jade came into Berth 5, that's what we called it back then, over in Oakland, there was a picket line set up, a community picket line. And one of the first people in the picket line, I guess some of you here were probably in the picket line, but Howard was in the picket line then. <laughs> and so. We, we put up a pick a line for four days. On the third day, the company said, we had enough of this. Let's call in the arbitrator. Let's get the Oakland police down here. And the arbitrator said, OK, to the business agent, Local 10. He said, we've got the police. Your men are standing by on safety. They don't want to cross this community picket line. We've got the OPD here. They're going to open up the picket line, and you guys can go safely to work. And the business agent looked at the arbitrator and the company. He says, you're out of your goddamn minds if you think we're going to go through a picket line like a bunch of scabs when on every July 5th, Bloody Thursday, we shut down every port on the West Coast because police killed two strikers. We'll never do that. <laughs> and so the picket line was sustained. Longshoremen didn't cross it, and on the fourth day, the ship sailed. They couldn't find any port in the west coast of the U.S., so they went to Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada is an ILWU port. <laughs> Nobody worked the ship. They didn't even come in. Once they saw a picket line was set up, they headed over to Yokohama, Japan. They're our friends, our comrades in struggle. <laughs> The ship didn't get work in, in Yokohama. And that's what that poster is talking about. We train the multinationals. We had international labor solidarity. And a great part of that happened because of Brian McWilliams. He had the foresight to understand what international labor solidarity was about. And he got the entire ILW behind that action. So that, that was the Neptune Jade, 1987. Um, 1997, thank you. Um, but again, Howard was uh, on that picket line, and he's always honored picket lines. That means you don't cross a picket line, and you don't work behind a picket line. And uh, I like to call Howard, he, you know, he's born in Appalachia. I call, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. <laughs> We got a few Appalachian hillbillies. I call him a red hillbilly <laughs> because he's principled, he's honest to the core, and he carries through his convictions in class struggle actions. He deserves that plaque. Thank you, comrade.
Our next, uh, we have a video from Steve Zeltzer. Where is your video? Okay, this is a uh, uh, history of, of Howard's actions on the docks. Five minutes. They, uh, yes, I am speaking on behalf of the uh, Bolshevik Tendency, the group that Howard played a central role in for well over 30 years. During his long life, Howard has done a lot of things, but he is above all a political person. His political views evolved as his understanding developed over time, but his commitment to fighting for the exploited and downtrodden and advocating a revolutionary social transformation has never changed. Howard is an incurable optimist who has always operated on the basis that a good example can be contagious given the right set of circumstances. He has never been afraid to call things by their right names and speak the truth to the masses, however bitter it might be. Howard never curried favor or made political decisions on the basis of wanting to advance his career or get a pat on the head or avoid getting into trouble. Howard learned long ago that those who look for shortcuts soon end up trimming their programs and stretching the truth, and before too long, idealistic, young, subjective revolutionaries can end up in places they could never have imagined when they started out. As a very young man in the U.S. Army at the end of World War II, Howard witnessed firsthand the hatred and contempt the officer corps had for the enlisted men and intuitively understood how this reflected the structural inequalities of the larger capitalist social order. Inspired by a vision of the socialist future, he enlisted in the Communist Party as soon as he got out of the army. He did so because he saw the CP as the vehicle by which hunger, war, racism, exploitation, and oppression could be ended. Howard, who was from a plebeian background, had enrolled in pre-med but some CP talent spotter instead rerouted him into the working class, and he ended up in the ILWU. He stayed in the party throughout the McCarthy period and was important enough to attract interest from the FBI. But he was never entirely comfortable in the Stalinist movement and always tended to be a bit of a leftist deviant. By the early 1960s, was three girls to bring up. He left the CP, although he, re he remained politically active in the union. Then one day in the 1970s, he bought a second-hand copy of Isaac Deutscher's book, The Prophet Armed, and stayed up all night reading it. He immediately understood that many things that he had never liked about the CP's line and doubts he had about the Kremlin's foreign policy had their roots in the Stalin-Trotsky fight during the 1920s. Before long, he figured out that the Spartacist League was the real con continuity of Trotsky's politics and linked up with them. In 1974, when Howard came around the SL, it was a very dynamic organization with a healthy appetite for revolutionary work in the unions. Howard was instrumental in launching the militant caucus in the ILWU, which within a few years recorded some impressive successes. But at the same time, the top leadership of the SL began to show signs of significant political de degeneration. In 1981, this process intersected Howard's trade union, union work rather dramatically during the PATCO, air traffic controller strike. The SL policy had been to agitate for mass solidarity union pickets to shut down the San Francisco airport. The idea was that if this happened, it might be a springboard for launching a general strike. Howard, a member of the Local 10 Exec Board, was, was ideally situated to head up this work. He arranged for PATCO reps to speak to Local 10 and other unions, and was invited by PATCO to sit, uh, sit in on their strike strategy meetings. And then the SL leadership suddenly announced an internal policy not to be publicly advertised, of ignoring the union boycott of the struck airports. Fly, fly, fly was their new slogan. Howard was caught by surprise. 
A lot of people in and around the SL had a queasy feeling about this, but only Howard, his wife Lucy, and a youth member, Lisa, had the political courage to openly object. Howard has always been a stand-up guy. He was never the type to adjust his principles under pressure. The SL leadership became very hostile and had him pushed out of the militant caucus. Howard continued his work in the Union and began publishing the militant Long Sermon. Before long, he and Usi found some co-thinkers and launched a competing organization, initially known as the External Tendency, today the Bolshevik Tendency. The 1984 11-day anti-apartheid anti cargo boycott was probably the most outstanding single accomplishment in Howard's storied Union career. The SL reacted bitterly and scandalously attempted to wreck this action, slandering the militants who carried it out as scabs. There are at least a few comrades here today who were down at the pier, down at pier, on Pier 80 that night and remember what happened. The SL leadership launched a vicious slander cam campaign against Howard. They called him a rat, an aspiring bureaucrat, and lots of other ugly things. Some who drank the uh, Jimstown Kool-Aid still engage in this sort of stuff, alleging that Howard and his comrades are all right with crossing picket lines, among other things. Cynical leftists can get pretty nasty. But the fact that some people are still so anxious to malign Howard's record and the politics he stands for is, in a perverse way, a sort of tribute. Lenin observed that old revolutionaries are often celebrated and turned into harmless icons by their enemies. Howard has not been. This is still, he is still considered too dangerous. <laughs> Howard's exemplary work in the ILWU provides a model for future revolutionary activists. He was able to achieve what he did because over the years, his fellow union members learned that he was honest, serious, steady, and sensible. He was able to explain things, sometimes complicated things like the need for a socialist revolution in ways that made sense. He was also able to work with people on particular projects with whom he had very serious differences. Workers, including those who did not agree with his politics, respected him because they knew that he was absolutely sincere and that he could be trusted to do what he said he would. Howard understood that without revolutionary organization, the working people are only material for exploitation and recognized that the essential task is therefore to build a viable revolutionary organization rooted in the working class, something much easier said than done. Howard always had a knack for picking up on whatever possibility existed at a particular moment to push things forward. The 1984 Longsword Boycott which began with a discussion between Howard, Lucy, and Bob Mandel around the kitchen table, was ultimately ended by a federal injunction. At that point, the, the United Front that carried it out split, and Howard's erstwhile partners folded, while he defiantly helped organize a picket line to keep the pier closed. After an hour and several arrests, the picket line was dispersed and the boycott was over, but it made a lasting impact. It showed what labor led by class conscious militants was capable of. It was deeply appreciated, appreciated by black trade unionists in South Africa. Years later, after apartheid was formally ended, Nelson Mandela came to the Bay Area and saluted the Longshore militants who made it happen. Howard has often remarked that the older he gets, the more profoundly convinced he becomes of the validity of the Trotskyist program and the vital importance of struggling to build an organizational vehicle to advance it. Like all great revolutionaries, Howard is motivated by concerns that go far beyond his own immediate personal interests. His life spent participating in a struggle vastly larger than himself was, has not negated his individuality, but fulfilled it. His devotion to fight on behalf of all the wretched of the earth has lifted him up and sustained him and made him the person he is, a working class hero who is among the very finest human beings who walks this earth. He fought the good fight and never flinched. 
He put all his strength and all his ability into the class struggle, and he has made a difference. We in the Bolshevik tendency are proud to be able to call Howard Keeler our comrade. Thanks. Thank you, Henry. And are we ready for the video now? This is a video by Steve Zeltzer, the Labor Video Project and the Transport Worker Solidarity Committee. By the way, that, that anti-Zionist uh, action by the Longshore Union was, you only got the visuals outside of the terminal, but inside, longshoremen were working a slowdown. And one of the prominent people in that slowdown was Larry's son, Aaron Wright, again, following in his father's footsteps. Uh, Howard mentioned in there about the grain struggle up in the, the Northwest and how this was, this settlement in Longview was the first incursion on the union hiring hall that qualitatively changed how dispatch works. We've always had a rotary democratic dispatch on jobs, but what happened in Longview, the union officials capitulated and they signed a contract which the employer can pick whoever they want for the job. That was very, very bad. And if you take a look at the banner behind me. This was about the Longview struggle, All right? And it, what Obama was sending in an armed Coast Guard cutter to protect a scab ship that was coming in. And that's when the international leadership of the ILWU caved in and had the contract signed. It was a terrible, terrible betrayal. And I want to read from you a short quote from the president of the Longview Longshore Local at that time, Dan Kaufman. He writes, I will never forget Howard Kaler. The passion he has for our union showed when you introduced us to him before we went on the Occupy event. That night, in that restaurant, he sat next to me. He was passionate about our struggle as for, the, as for the struggles from the past. He was so rich with knowledge because he lived it. And that's from Dan Coughlin about Howard. And his reference to the Occupy movement is, I think most of you remember here in the Bay Area, some of you who are applauding were part of, Occupy marched on the port of Oakland when the police in Oakland attacked uh, Occupy people that were in an encampment and also in solidarity with the Longview struggle. Something like 30 or 40,000 people marched into it. Uh, Robert Erminger uh, actually has a counter. He works on the ferry boats. And what was the figure that you came up with? Anyway, we were using the figure 30,000 or 40,000. 40,000. 40, 40, oh, excuse me, Brother Thomas. <laughs> but, um, you know, this Occupy movement was a left populist movement that the union could have worked with to win the struggle in Longview. That's what they did in 34. They linked up with people in the community. So, anyway. Our, our next speaker is Howard's daughter, Aloha, all the way from Washington, D.C. Let's see if this is... Good afternoon. My name is Aloha Kaler, and I'm the middle of Howard's three daughters. And on behalf of myself, my sisters Heather and Ashurda, and my family, I want to thank the ILWU both for honoring my father today and for the important ways in which the unique support of the ILWU helped our family during difficult times. One of Nelson Mandela's biographers noted that the great sadness of his personal life was that because of his political activities, his family were all obliged to make sacrifices that were never asked of them 
but forced upon them. Noting that one of his granddaughters told the author, we feel that people like Madiba, who are going to take up causes in that way, perhaps ought not to have children. And while he didn't spend decades incarcerated on Robben Island, certainly my father's political activities had consequences for our family, consequences that the ILW helped to mitigate in important ways for which we will always be grateful. When I first learned of this event, I was in a remote mountain area of Michoacan, Mexico. I had been visiting some of the indigenous areas in Mexico, and while I grew up in the Bay Area, I've been living for the past 20 plus years outside of Washington, DC, where until my recent retirement, I taught English and reading to immigrant children, many from El Salvador and various countries in Africa. I didn't think I would be able to attend this event, but was fortunately able to return in time to share this occasion with my dad and all of you. I'm a bit jet lagged and also readjusting to being in the US and navigating all the subtle and unwritten codes of living here. Although I'm in my 60s, I have done extensive international travel. I still find it difficult crossing borders. Mainly it's crossing back into the US that I find unsettling. My heart beats rapidly and my hands sweat and if my husband is with me, I have him do all the talking. While I try to look as normal, cool as possible, all the while reviewing mentally my contingency plans if the worst were to happen. My fear is that when they scan my passport, they will see that I'm Howard Kaler's daughter <laughs> and then take me into custody and sequester me in some unknown place out of contact with my family and friends a fear shared by many of my students and their families. Where does this fear come from? As far back as I can remember, I can hear my dad telling me, Aloha, always have a current passport because you never know when you'll have to leave the country in a hurry. <laughs> An admonition I follow to this day. And while there is no basis for me to be detained at the border, the fear of persecution from anonymous government authorities is never far from my mind, a legacy of my childhood reinforced by current events. It amused me that while in Mexico, I was often referred to by indigenous women as huerita, meaning little white girl, which I found very funny because one of the mental adjustments I make when returning to the US is being a brown girl. And as I cross back to the US, I am reminded of this in so many subtle ways, in part because growing up with Howard as my father was an in-depth education in the ways of racial and political prejudice in America. When my dad saw my mother, he thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen with her dark complexion and kinky jet black hair. He had never seen a Filipina before, not being one to bow to societal mores and dictates, he pursued my mother for several years to the dismay both of his family and my mother's. And when the laws against interracial marriage was struck down in California in 1948, they married and eventually had three daughters, my sisters and me. Life didn't get easier once they were married. As my sisters and I were growing up in South Stockton in a largely Filipino, Mexican, and African-American community, whenever we would go out with our dad, we got dirty looks and rude service at restaurants and stores. People couldn't understand why a white, blue-eyed blonde, daddy had more hair then, <laughs> man was out with three brown girls. Back then, you just didn't see many mixed race people. It's not like today, where despite lingering racial prejudices, you see mixed race people everywhere. Their images are included in TV commercials to sell stuff to targeted demographics. But when we were growing up, the races weren't supposed to mix. But for Howard, his love for my mother mattered more. And racism was not the only obstacle in conflict with my father's principles. Before becoming a longshoreman, my walk, father worked in various jobs organizing workers such as Filipino cannery workers. 
However, because of his political activities, he soon found himself surveilled by the FBI. They routinely visited every employer whenever he got a new job, pointedly telling them what a radical and dangerous person he was and that a patriotic American would not employ such an individual. Not surprisingly, he would be fired the next day. This continued for years and, for, and made for a scary and uncertain childhood. Whenever we moved, the men sitting in suits in nice cars parked outside our house stood out because you just didn't see white men like that in our kind of neighborhood. We knew immediately they were FBI agents spying on us, and I remember the knocks on the door at night and my dad, who knew from previous encounters, telling my mother not to engage in conversation with the FBI. They were cunning and would find a way to use your words against you. I remembered the tension of those late night knocks produced in a frightened child, and I worried that during one such visit, they would take my father away and I'd never see him again. Howard continued to divide, divide their su surveillance and intimidation and remained politically active. But he couldn't escape from losing job after job and money was tight. My mother's sister, whose husband was a seasonal farm worker, would give us money for food when they could. As difficult as things got, I always liked hanging out with my dad and when I was young, when I was young I remember going with him to a hall with lots of men talking and smoking cigarettes. There was a man on a speaker announcing things I couldn't make out. And I worried for my dad, how could he make sense of the voices on the speaker over the din of echoing other voices? I learned later that the place I visited with him was the beginning of a change for my dad and our lives. That place was the ILW hiring hall where my dad picked up occasional work as a B-man and then eventually steady work as an A-man. Man. Finally, he had an income he could count on and critically, union benefits for his family. Because of the fierce political independence of the ILWU, including control over hiring, blacklisted activists like my father were able to work and support their families during a very dark and repressive time. <laughs> For this, I will always be grateful to the ILWU for making a huge difference in my dad's life and the life of our family. My dad would go on to work as an ILWU militant for many years and would in turn help to shape and push forward the legacy of the ILWU as a defender of working people around the world. For all these reasons, it is an honor and a pleasure to thank the ILWU for this event today recognizing and celebrating my father and his contributions, and for the important difference the ILW made in all of our lives. Thank you. That was Thank you so much, Aloha. I, I just want to read a, a brief passage from Professor Peter Cole history uh, professor at Western Illinois University. He wrote a letter to Howard, and this is what it said in part. When we met in Berkeley in 2011, I already had started researching the union to which you had dedicated more than half a century of your life, the ILWU. I had written a book on the radical longshoremen of Philadelphia in the World War I era. The Wobblies were so radical, they united ranks across craft, ethnic, national and racial lines to forge a strong union. Of course, employers and the state went after them for those very reasons. Fast forward to the, my next effort to understand the traditions and histories of uh, dock workers. What other union by ILW Local 10 could possibly be of more interest to me, a labor historian who appreciates the potential of dock workers? Over coffee and cigarettes, you schooled me in some of the hidden history of the docks in San Francisco, Oakland, and beyond. Thanks to your trust in me, as well as many others in the ILWU, I've written Dock Worker Power, 
race and activism in Durban, South Africa, that is, and the San Francisco Bay Area, which will be published next month. I very much look forward to seeing you in March when I next return to the Bay Area. On that visit, I have, I'll have a signed copy of my book to present to you as a very small token of my deep appreciation and respect, exclamation mark. <laughs> Love and solidarity, Peter Cole. <laughs> so when Peter Cole talks about interviewing Longshoremen for his book, one of the people he interviewed is the next speaker, Clarence Thomas. Brother Thomas, come on up. Sisters and brothers, comrades and friends of ILW Local 10, it's great to be a part of this momentous occasion. Before I get started, I want to say one thing. I'm not going to speak as long as Jack Heyman. <laughs> I promise you that. With all due respect, Jack. Uh, belated happy birthday, Howard. Let me first say that Howard has outlived most of his contemporaries and many of his class enemies. Yeah. During his remarkable life of revolutionary struggle. And I'd just like to pay tribute to a true union brother and comrade that has left an indelible footprint in the shaping of ILWU in particular his contributions in providing Local 10 with its revolutionary character. And I want to underscore the word revolutionary because I think too many of us are afraid to use that word. What does a revolutionary look like who is a part of the working class in the United States of America? Howard's Kaler. And I have one bone to, to pick with you, Howard. Out of all the years that I've known you, you never have corrected me in mispronouncing your last name. I've been calling you Keeler for I don't know how long, and it's Kaler. ILWU has been in the vanguard of the ILWU. Local 10 has been in the vanguard of, ILW local, of the ILWU in terms of the struggle for freedom, justice, and human rights. And Howard Kaler has been a critical contributor in creating that hi history and legacy for more than seven decades. Howard is, is an important example of a true unionist who sought to build class struggle opposition and consciousness within the labor movement. Throughout his years in the ILWU, he has been committed to the struggle of freedom, justice, and human rights for the working class and the oppressed all around the world. I'm particularly touched by the fact that Howard came to the ILWU with class consciousness. Perhaps him coming from Appalachia, perhaps his being a part of the war, World War II in Okinawa, definitely forged his anti-militarism, his anti-racism, and his anti-imperialist character. Howard is a sterling example to all rank and filers of the ILWU but in particular to our white brothers and sisters, because he has taught us the intersectionality between race and class as the underpinnings of capitalism. The men who were involved in leading the strike in 1934, who were leftists, communists, Radicals, anarchists, their names have been mentioned earlier. Harry Bridges, Jermaine Bulky, uh, Henry Smith, 
Henry Schmidt. And also, of course, Harry Bridges. They were able to break through the mindset of white supremacy during the height of the Great Depression. And with all of the odds that they were facing, they understood that they were not going to be successful in winning that strike without working class solidarity, which meant the support of the black community. They had the vision and the courage to appeal to the black community to support that strike. And not out of some abstract liberal vision, but on concrete principles of discrimination as a tool of the bosses. It's a means of dividing the working class. Today in 2018, the working class stands divided. It is men like Howard Keeler who has spent a lifetime in trying to build unity and solidarity within the working class. <laughs> Brother Bob, Brother Bob Johnson? Henry. What's your name? Henry. I'm sorry, Henry. I, I just turned 71 a few <laughs> months ago and I, I'm having a senior moment. You made reference to SL, Spartans' League. And if any one of us who has any uh, experience here in the union or has been involved in the struggle over the years, we know who they are. They're out in front of our hall selling the newspapers at every union meeting. And I just want to say one thing. There's such a thing as an armchair revolutionary and a real one. Armchair revolutionaries don't have economic sanctions put on them by the state for taking actions that disrupts international cargo, which people like Howard Keeler and Leo Robinson and others, those are not armchair revolutionaries, brothers and sisters and comrades. <laughs> I'm gonna wind, wrap it up with this. Howard Keeler represents the consciousness, courage, and vision of those men that I spoke of earlier in 1934 who went to the black community and appealed to them to join the strike. And that was a turning point because black people had been used as scabs because that was the only time we had the chance to make a living on the waterfront. He represents that vision and courage and consciousness that those men represented. I'm so glad, Howard, to be able to celebrate your life and also the fact that he's alive. <laughs> my mother is fond of saying, give me my flowers while I'm alive and not when I'm dead. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. An injury to one is an injury to all. Divided we stand. United we stand, divided we fall. That's more than a slogan. Slogans of solidarity are not empty, and Howard realizes that. It costs something when you stand in solidarity, and Howard has certainly been a sterling example of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clarence. Uh, so our next speaker is the president of the Marine Division of the ILWU, the Inland Boatman's Union, Marina Secretano. First, I just want to say uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. It's such an honor to be here. Um, you know, also I just want to acknowledge Jack. Uh, you know, Jack and I go way back. Um, he's an amazing person. And not everybody sees that amazingness. Some people <laughs> misunderstand him. But I just want to say the day that he went to uh, Local 10 and left the IBU was a sad day for us. 
Um, he stayed close to us uh, throughout, you know, the many years, and that is amazing. And uh, his uh, recollection of our struggle with the Crowley strike is real. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actions and people like Howard and Jack that really allow us to uh, impart on our members what, what it looks like when you stand up for what you believe in. And, you know, as a new president, it's, I've been in this office almost a year, I come from the Bay Area as a regional director, and, you know, it's always easy to say it should be, would be, you know, if I was there, it would be this and that, and i do this. So I've felt that way for many years. <laughs> well, now I have reality on that <laughs> and what it takes. And, you know, um, I think the value of being here for all of us is to keep alive what it means when you give yourself to a cause, you know? And Howard definitely has given himself to a cause, and he lives that cause on a daily basis. And what we're facing today, just to kind of bring it back to my reality, the Janus decision. You know, um, I wish all my members could be here and hear the things that you stand for, Howard and really impart that because we've had to impart, we have a lot of public workers, if you didn't know that, our ferry workers in Alaska, Washington, and the Bay Area. And so now they don't have to pay dues. And in San Francisco, we have a hiring hall, so we get a great opportunity to work with our members and keep that uh, energy alive about the union, but not in every area. You know, we got 1,200 workers in Washington and we don't have a hiring hall there. So that means for us a daily contact with our members to really keep them in the loop. And I don't know if you know this about our uh, history, Howard, I'm sure you do, but um, in 1979 we left our international because we were being sold down the river, got a new president, and we actually left our international. And uh, we had a strike and we went in with Jimmy Herman into the ILWU, and that was amazing. Um, we went on strike in uh, Washington because we were being mistreated. We couldn't get wage increases. You know, when you're a public employee and your wages are funded by the state, you can bargain with the state and win a good contract and then out have it funded. And you get sick and tired of that, you know. So anyway, we went on strike there, and in fact, they jailed our president and our secretary treasurer. And the longshore shut down, you know, the, the docks. They stopped working <laughs> until they let our president and our secretary treasurer out of jail. You know, that is amazing. So as a result of all that, our workers in Washington don't have the right to strike anymore because of that. However, what they created was a commission that they've been very successful in getting through grievances. I think we've won almost everything through the years while we had that commission. <laughs> but um, the point being that, you know, we can't use that amazing power of strike in Washington, at the Washington State Ferry. So we, but we have used it in Crowley. And yeah, maybe we didn't win that strike in the sense that we would have liked to. But what we did have is many, many years of labor peace up and down the coast in our towing sector because of the work Jack did and Howard did and the struggle that our members had for that nine month strike. So in 2012, we went on strike against the Golden Gate Ferry, another public employer, you know, trying to press us and, you know. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing what that kind of solidarity does. And it's not a thing we do all the time, but what struggle does, it re-energizes our members. It re-energizes our belief in our unions. And it really kind of takes us back to the core. And, with, you know, so I'm looking at a lot of millennials <laughs> and young people who weren't out there on picket lines or peace marches. And, you know, we got to energize them. And it's going to be through the work that Howard's done and Jack's done and so many of us here and Brian have done through the years and Steve, you know, that they get to hear about what really it's like to give yourself to a cause. So I just want to thank you again and thank you, Howard, for all your uh, commitment. You know, there's so many sacrifices you make when you give yourself to this cause, you know. So thank you again and uh, thank you.
Um, the next uh, point on the program was a, a recording from Omiya Bujamal, which isn't ready right now. So, uh, Bob Mandel, can you come up, please? Bob Mandel was in the Militant Caucus in the ILW with Howard Taylor. Um, I want to start off by reading something that Howard wrote about caucuses. He says a key component of winning a programmatic base is the lesson that only those who understand the state as a boss's state can even defend the basic gains of the trade unions. And that's the basis that Howard has worked all these years. And I want to talk about an earlier time the work that we did and that Howard was central in was key in reviving and restoring the traditions of militancy and international solidarity that the ILW had been founded on. When I met Howard in 1973, the ILW was flat on its back. It had just lost a 130-day long short strike coastwide. It lost the strike because in the middle of the strike, the government issued a Taft-Hartman injunction and Bridges ordered every longshoreman to go back to work. And Bridges visited every port up and down the coast and said, you will be expelled from the union if you don't go back to work. And this was in complete contradiction to 1948, when the union defied the first half tartly and when telegrams were sent around the world to communist and socialist waterfront unions saying, don't unload American ships that were loaded by strike breakers and troops. They won in 48, they lost in 71. The first two actions that Howard and I and Peter Wollstone and Jack Dow worked on were a chili boycott and then a strike of non-documented workers in Union City. The Chile boycott in 1974 was the first time the ILWU had done a political strike in 20 years. The last one had been in the Hawaiian Islands when Jack Hall was being put in jail the communist leader of the ILWU put in jail under the Smith Act, and the ILWU shut the islands for four days. When the Chile coup happened, yes. And when the Chile coup happened, Bridges and Goldblatt talked and talked and talked and never acted. 450 local 10 and local 34 members signed a petition demanding high cargo action against the Pinochet regime. And we organized it from the inside, and people in LA organized it from the outside, and we shut down Chilean cargo. That was September 74. That was the union beginning to revive itself after the defeat in 71. Three months later, scabs were brought against the ILW for the first time since 1948. That was at KNC Glass 
in Union City, a place no one has ever heard of. All but one of the workers at that factory were undocumented workers. There was immediately an injunction issued order and nobody essentially, six person picket lines. The police started drawing guns on the picketers. So what did we do? Howard and Stan Gow and the rest of us First, we went to Local 34. The clerks identified glass that was being brought in from Poland that would be processed and worked by the workers at KNC, and they lost the glass. For two weeks, that container just disappeared. <laughs> and then we, we went to the warehouses in the area, and we said to the members in Local 6, we said to the members of Local 6, look, if they can bust this strike and this house, the rest of us will be next, and Longshore will be next. So people walked off the job in solidarity from surrounding warehouses. And we had a pitched battle with the police, and we kept the scabs out, and the strike was won. And, and my time, I'm sorry, my voice is so bad, but Howard is probably one of the only people in the world who was assaulted by Harry Bridges. The reward, the recognition for the chili boycott and for the K and C work and for the regular publication of the Longshore Warehouse Militant for a union-wide strike to defend the Canadian ILWU. Harry personally organized, I speak as a geriatric, Harry personally organized a geriatric goon squad at the 1975 International Convention to come out and attack us, rip up our literature, and throw us out of the convention. Didn't work. And that's how it, it didn't work. I want to say two more things. Um, one thing that Mumia doesn't mention in the tape, in the many, many, many struggles Howard has participated in. One of my favorite memories, how many of you remember the White Knight riots in San Francisco? Okay. Dan White had just been acquitted, or no, involuntary manslaughter, two years, three years, right, for murdering Harvey Milk and Moscone, and the Castro erupted and fought back and burned 29 police cars. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and two or three days later, there was a mass march of about 25,000 people, and we were on it. Howard always was in every battle. And the last thing I want to say is about the Zim blockade. I think one has to honestly say that if we're not for Howard's personal tenacity and ISIS and some of the other folks in the room tonight, that action would never have succeeded. Zim would never, Peter, Zim would never have been driven out. And some of us who did that after seven or eight days thought, it's time to 
call this off because we were hearing that the longshoremen were not strong on the issue, even though they were strong on the picket line. And Howard said no, and Howard showed up whatever time that was at three in the morning or at midnight and held the line, and the line held, and Zim sailed away, and Zionist Israel doesn't ship to the Bay Area. Thank you, Bob. Uh, now we have a recorded message for Howard from Mumia Bujamal. Before I introduce the next speaker, there's a letter here from the Maritime Union of Australia, Port of Brisbane, from Bob Carnegie. He says, your life, Howard, has not been an easy one, but you decided to tread a path more difficult than most, the honest working class fighter's approach to life. You broke from Stalinism 50 years ago. My break was 30 years ago. It was the most difficult decision I made made easier by the writings of the incomparable Victor Serge and George Ordwell, and of course, Leon Trotsky's seminal work, The History of the Russian Revolution. For me, the cost was great, but it has been worth it. To see things clearly and to see things honestly from a working class perspective has helped me, and I'm sure yourself, to keep the faith over a lifetime. Your life, Howard, inspires men like myself to do better. Your life is a testament to the standing against the wind and holding the vessel on course through all of life's travails. Have a great day, Howard, surrounded by love and respect. What more could we want from this life? Bob Carnegie. And now, uh, final speaker is Isis, who did the uh, incredible video. Isis, Howard's daughter. Hi. I'm going to read so that I stay focused and don't take up all the time. Howard became my dad when I was 14, when he married my mother and imported us from Germany. My uncle was a longshoreman in Hamburg, so I quickly felt at home with Local 10. I especially remember brothers Fred Addison and Bill Bailey and Gene Weisberger from Local 34 welcoming us into the ILWU family. Much of my political foundation was laid by the activist family I came from, but what I learned as Howard's daughter was how to put my principles into action. I was turning 18 when the 1984 boycott happened. Shortly after, Howard, my mother, and I joined the campaign against apartheid, a direct action-oriented united front based at UC Berkeley, and the, 19, six, the 1986 blockade became the first direct action I ever helped organize. Howard taught me that to make real change requires taking risks. 
Being named in the injunction in 84 did not stop him from continuing the boycott and risking significant jail time. He took the same risk in 86 when he returned to Pier 80 with the campaign, who knew what he was risking and had his back. When the cops put Howard in the paddy wagon, comrades staged a distraction that allowed him to escape. Oh. A local paper published the photo you saw in the video and determined to pretend that no dock workers supported the action, claimed an old drunk who'd been picked up downtown used the chaos of the student protest as an opportunity to make a run for it. <laughs> That caption became the punchline for many jokes at campaign meetings. But the truth is, his understanding of the maritime industry and connections in the union made the action possible and as effective as it was. We prevented the ship from being worked for two shifts. On the second day, Howard was among the 60 arrests, but again avoided prison. It's good to have movement lawyers, and we had Dennis Cunningham to thank for that one. Being Howard's daughter meant organizing meetings at the dinner table and sometimes political purges that changed who was part of the village that helped raise me. It wasn't always easy, but I got an education at home and in the streets that's more valuable than anything I ever learned in school. When other families went to amusement parks and parades, we were on picket lines or defending abortion clinics. That was a long time ago and decades since Howard retired from working on the docks but he has yet to retire from his commitment to make the world a better place. He was in his mid-80s when we participated in the Occupy Oakland actions on, at the port, both of them, and when we drove to Davis in the middle of the night to help shut down a Monsanto facility. He was pushing 90 during the community pickets of the Israeli Zim ships, which were in the same spirit as our 1986 action against South African apartheid. Just a couple of years ago, the Coalition to Defend East Bay Forests, which he co-founded, discussed how to stop the deforestation of the East Bay Hills. And he told us he was prepared to place his body between the trees and the chainsaws. <laughs> Howard's sense of solidarity comes from a deep place of empathy and courage. Even at his advanced age, he stepped in to protect others. Just last year, I watched him rush across a room to shield a comrade from a bully twice her size and substantially larger than Howard. A couple years prior, he inserted himself between me and a cop who was kicking me out of a CPUC meeting for doing civil disobedience with Stop Smart Meters. But with Howard's days of street fighting over and neo-fascist networks emboldened by Trump, we've been sharing our relief to see a determined and militant anti-fascist resistance emerging among a younger generation. Yeah. As Howard has been confronted with aging and several of us becoming disabled by toxic injuries, disability rights and environmental health have become increasingly personal. In that context, we work together to fight pesticide applications by the Light Brown Apple Moth program and wireless smart, smart utility grid that is sickening and disabling people and causing fires. We've also protested electroshock at Berkeley's Herrick Hospital. It's still happening there. And against the American Psychiatric Association as a whole. Howard witnessed psychiatric torture in his 20s when he worked at the Stockton State Hospital, aka the Snake Pit as well as in his own family, including when his father and brother became victims of electroshock and forced drugging. I used to expect other labor activists to act just like my dad, which turned out not to be so realistic. <laughs> I was disturbed by so-called informational picket lines that encouraged people to cross, by union endorsements for capitalist politicians, and by the lack of solidarity strikes between unions, let alone strikes to help working class communities in general. Howard taught me the importance of the labor movement as a primary force for social justice, but he also taught me the uncomfortable and thoroughly unromantic history of union bureaucracies getting in the way of doing what needs to be done, and that sometimes we can't wait for movements and leaders to catch up and just have to do it ourselves. His constant challenges to bureaucracy and authority contributed to a nice Bolshevik like my dad, raising an anarchist daughter like myself, and I thank him for it. Howard has influenced my life the way other parents do, but more than just my dad, he's also my comrade. And as we've both grown older and wiser, he has also become one of my best friends. I love you, Howard. Have a good day.
And I believe the next person up is Maxina Ventura, who worked with us in the campaign against apartheid 33 years ago, as well as currently with the Coalition to Defend East Bay Forests. Where's Maxine? She's right there. Oh, okay. I was wondering. Okay, you're going to sing? I'm going to speak, speak right and then sit. Yes. So, um, the campaign against apartheid at UC Berkeley. Um, I had had uh, some very intense background, radical background of solidarity work with the Livermore Action Group um, a little bit prior to um, what we did at Pier 80, but I wanted to explain a little bit about our process in organizing around the Pier 80 actions in 86. So imagine a, a room, you know, maybe half this size, a lot of people organizing week after week, and all these groups sending in people to kind of pluck out, try to pluck out activists to do, do their bidding. But as we talked with as we talked with Howard and Ushi about what to do, what could we do practically speaking? Um, what actions could we take? We had our actions that we did on campus, the Shantytown act, act, actions, which were very, very important, our occupations on campus. But we wanted to do something else as well. So we brainstormed. We sat down and brainstormed, and here's what stands out about the, the work with Howard. He didn't say, come do our bidding. He said, well, you know, we all sat together and said, what can we do? How can we make a significant impact? And, and we, thought we, we thought about how we could also safeguard the workers to the best of our ability. How could we have an action in, uh, in which they could participate but without getting picked off and plucked off and having, having their economic lives wrecked, right? So we were learning as a campaign against apartheid about the bringing together um, of people on the docks with others from the community, how we could work together to advance this movement for an end to apartheid. So the the coming in and the brainstorming part. This is why I've always considered Howard as a, a very important mentor in my life. That, that action of not saying, do what I want you to do, but saying, let's figure out together what, could, what we can do and make sure that nobody gets uh, you know, thrown to the curb in the process. So I thank you for that, because that's been a model throughout you know, these other decades, all these decades in between in the rest of the organizing I've done. I see very true to that idea of how can we work together and how can we make sure nobody is thrown to the curb in the process. So thank you, Howard, and happy birthday. And at Howard's request, <clears throat> about the diggers in 1649 in England who took over the land for the betterment of the people. In 1649 to St. George's Hill, a ragged band they called the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlords. They defied the laws. They were the dispossessed reclaiming what was theirs. We come in peace, they said, to dig and sow. We come to work the lands in common and to make the wastelands grow this earth divided. We will make whole, so it will be a common treasury for all. Thus in our property we do disdain. No one has any right to buy or sell the earth for private gain. By theft and murder, they stole the land. Now everywhere the walls rise up at their command. They make the laws to chain us well. 
Their clergy dazzle us with heaven, or they damn us into hell. We will not worship the God they serve. The God of greed who feeds the rich while poor folks starve. We work, we eat together, we need no swords. We will not bow to the masters, nor pay rent to the lords. We are free people, though we are poor. You diggers all stand up for glory, stand up now. From the men of property, the orders came. They sent their hired men and troopers to wipe out the diggers' claim, tear down their cottages, destroy their corn. They were dispersed, but still their vision lingers on. You poor take courage, you rich take care. This earth was made a common treasury for everyone to share. All things in common, all people want. We come in peace, the orders came to cut them down. We work, we eat together, we need no swords. We will not bow to the masters, nor pay rent to the lords. We are free people, though we are poor. You diggers all stand up for glory, stand up now. You diggers all stand up for glory, stand up now. However, however, when they tie the can to a union man, sit down, sit down. When they tell, give him the sack, they'll take him back. Sit down, sit down. Sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got a beat. Sit down, sit down. This is Maurice Sugarman. When they smile and say no raise and pay, sit down, sit down. When you lock the boss to come across, sit down, sit down. Sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got them beat. Sit down, sit down. When the speed up comes, just twiddle your thumbs. Sit down, sit down. You know what to know, they better go slow. Sit down, sit down. Sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got them beat. Sit down, sit down. When the boss won't talk, don't take a walk. Sit down, sit down. When the boss sees that, he'll want a little chat. Sit down, sit down. Sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got a beat. Sit down, sit down. Sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got a beat. Sit down, sit down. Thank you, Maxina. That was Maxina Ventura. Um, we're coming to the conclusion of this program. So we're into the open mic section, and uh, we're beyond our time limit, but we're going to extend it. So those of you who feel a compulsion to come up here and speak, we're going to uh, call on you for one minute. So just make a line along here, please. One minute per person. Bonnie, start it off. Hi, hi there. I'm Barry. <laughs> and I was born in Kentucky, the daughter of a moonshiner. <laughs>